Okay, could I uh, welcome you to this session on the 21st century future opportunity or threat? Uh, my name is Michael Keith. I'm the uh, co-director of the University of Oxford Future of Cities program. I'm very glad to welcome everybody to what's going to be a fantastic uh, session t today. I'm really pleased uh, to open the, the, the session. The, the challenge of the cities of the 21st century we know is phenomenal. It's a cliche of our time that the world has gone urban a couple of years ago. But the, the scale of that, we know, is phenomenal. Um, if you look at China alone, uh, just by 2025, we're looking at the movement of somewhere between 250 to 300 million more people moving into the cities of China. And China will have something like 220, 230 cities of over a million people by 2025, 2030. If you think that Europe now only has a, a, about 30, 34 cities of that size, then you can just see the scale in China alone. Ch India, likewise, we're seeing urbanization with something like 68 cities of over a million. We know that that creates uh, major challenges. Sometimes it creates populist uh, resistance and unsettlement, and we've seen anger on the streets of various parts of the cities of the globe over the last year. If we look at uh, Caracas, we look at uh, Rio, you look at Bangkok, you look at Cairo. So we know that there are challenges to the, to the urban. We know that those are ecological challenges. We know that they're about how we share a future between people in a context where migration to the city has major benefits, but those benefits frequently accrue unevenly. Some uh, benefits of economics tend to accrue at the scale of the city as a whole, where a lot of the costs tend to <coughs> accrue in small neighborhoods. Uh, the, the benefits tend to accrue over the longer period of time. The transition periods can be in intensely difficult to manage. In that context, we have a fantastic panel today, all of whom are working on, on the ground and who are going to be addressing some of the, the creative opportunities that the city offers th directly through experience. Uh, co coming from the left, we have Osama Hassanen from Tekwadi, Doug Saunders from the, the Globe and Mail in Toronto, Melanie Edwards from uh, Make Mobile, Mobile Metrics, sorry, and also uh, on the far right we have Joel Bol Bolnick, who's the Secretariat Coordinator from an organization with a very uh, strong reputation, Slum Dwellers International. We're going to try and make the session relatively conversational, so we'll have them first of all say something about the context in which they're uh, th th this change is occurring before coming on on a second round to some of the, the creative solutions that we're finding on the ground today in the cities in which these guys are all working. And we'll, we'll then look for opportunities to open up a little bit before thinking about how we might scale some of these things up and learn on a global platform. So just to open uh, with a, uh, the first intervention, I'm going to ask Doug Saunders to say a little bit about uh, his work. There's, Doug did a fantastic book called Arrival City, which has sold a lot, but is also about how migration is changing the cities of the world. And has continued to do work and writing in that area and many others. So, Doug, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Um, my, I think my, my place on this panel is, is to be the mile wide and an inch deep uh, person. I can provide the cosmic overview. A little, uh, I've, I've done field work in about 25 cities on five continents for Arrival City and for work since then. And uh, my fellow panelists will provide much more detailed, in-depth information on specific cities. And then later on, we, I can talk about some of the interventions that, uh, that social ventures can, can provide and the role they can play in, uh, in the urban transformation. But let's look, at, let's look at the global overview here. Here we have a view of this century uh, from here we go, from the post-war period to 2050 with ourselves in the middle uh, looking at degrees of urbanization. And what's happened in the Western world, in North Western Europe and North America, is essentially that we were fully urbanized at the end of the Second World War. What appears to be a slight increase is in fact an artifact of the fact that there's been urban sprawl and a lot of rural areas have been reassigned statistically to be urban areas. But basically, uh, we Westerners have been about as urban as anyone gets uh, throughout the post-war period. 
The same is true for Australians and New Zealanders. Uh, our great period of rural to urban transition occurred from around the time of the French Revolution until around the time of the, uh, of the end of the First World War and caused a lot of the upheavals and conflicts and so on. But let's take a look at what's happened in Latin America. Uh, at the end of the Second World War, the L Latin American countries were generally uh, about two-thirds of their population were peasant farmers, were living in subsistence agriculture. And what we saw in the 50s, 60s, and 70s was a very rapid shift of rural populations to urban areas propelled by agricultural modernization, by transportation infrastructure, and more importantly, by the, the creation of networks of people from villages existing in cities to facilitate this shift uh, into urban economies. And no coincidence, this period here in Latin America was a period of difficulty, struggle, conflict, a lot of headlines about uh, coups, revolutions, riots, uprisings, and so on, a lot of which was sort of conflict over citizenship in the urban space, if you could put it that way, over the right to the city, uh, to use that phrase. And interestingly, starting around the very end of the 20th century, as the population of Latin America became about as urbanized as North America and Western Europe are, we saw the beginning of a decade, uh, and now a decade and a half, of generally speaking, democratic stability, economic growth, uh, declining inequality in places like Brazil, and, uh, and generally an, an end to the upheavals of that as the population st stabilized as an urban population. Now let's take a look at what's happening elsewhere. Here's Asia, and here's Africa. Now these are gross generalizations because you're conflating a whole lot of countries with very different experiences into this. I mean. At this point, China is past the 50% urban mark uh, five or six years ago, depending how you measure it. Um, in Africa, you have some places like South Africa and Libya that are now about as urbanized as the West is, and you have some that are, that are way, way down here in sub-Saharan countries. Um, but in general, what we're seeing is that the, more, the, the developing parts of Asia and Africa are right now beginning the shift to urban life that, uh, that took place in Latin America in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. You're seeing some of those conflicts. You're seeing some of those tensions uh, as urban space becomes contested. Um, and a lot of the conflicts we see in the world take place in what I call arrival cities, these bottom rung on the ladder districts in cities where people arrive from the village for the first time. The, uh, the Egyptian revolution began uh, in one of these districts. Uh, the, the, a lot of the conflicts in China are in what they call urban villages where, where the, this floating population exists halfway uh, and so on. And you, could go, you, go, you can look ac across Asia and Africa at this. What happens when this line moves upward? A few things happen. First of all, um, agricultural productivity increases. When you have fewer people living in rural areas, anywhere in the world you have greater food production. Uh, second of all, uh, measures of social progress improve. An, a more urban population has longer life expectancy, lower infant mortality, lower HIV AIDS susceptibility, higher rates of education of girls and women. Uh, pretty much any social and health indicator improves as a population urbanizes. And finally, uh, the other big thing that happens is family sizes become much smaller. Uh, anywhere in the world throughout history as populations move from down here to up here. Uh, regardless of culture or circumstances, you could look at Iran, which urbanized rather quickly in the 1970s and went from having uh, seven children per family in the 1980s to having 1.7 children per family, fewer than France. Now, uh, the shift to urbanization and the education uh, and economic opportunities that come with that cause reduction, reduction in population growth rates. You find that the, country, the handful of countries in the world, the 20 or so that are responsible for all the world's population growth uh, at the moment, also happen to be the countries that are the source of the most uh, unsolvable conflicts and so on, all tend to be down in this quadrant uh, at, the, at the moment. Uh, they are among the most rural countries in the world. Whether, whether that's a chicken and egg thing, whether, whether being in conflict and in poverty causes them to be rural or vice versa is something to discuss. 
but, uh, but uh, uh, generally speaking, we, we can see this happening. The only thing that causes these lines to not go upward like this uh, is military conflict, which can cause deurbanization, tends to be temporary, uh, and so on. Or a really serious disease pandemic like the HIV AIDS crisis caused a brief uh, downturn in urbanization rates in some countries. But generally speaking, this is what this is, the, this, is, this is what we've got to deal with. We can repeat the mistakes that Europe and North America made in the 18th and 19th centuries and pretend that these urbanizing districts are a threat to us and cause them to be so, or we can see them as an opportunity. And I think our next panelists will look at that opportunity. Great, thanks, thanks Doug. That sets us up nicely for Joel to say a little bit about the context in which Slum Dwellers International have been working, which, uh, Joel, over to you. Thank you very much. I think by now all of you have met my friend and colleague Jokin, who's sitting in the audience. I've had the privilege of walking and being with Jokin for 24 years in informal settlements and slums throughout the world, to the extent that in the SDI network there is a kind of iconographic image of this tall white guy walking hand in hand with the short brown guy <laughs> through the slums of the world. And during the course of that time, what has happened is that I've come to know a lot more about informality and understand a lot less. So I'm going to try to do the easy part now and tell you what I know. And if we get a chance to talk again later, I'll try to grapple with what I'm trying to understand. And I'd like to talk to you about two elements of the dimensions of poverty and, urbanized, and the urbanization of poverty. The first is a kind of sustainability dimension, which builds up on um, the discussion that we've just been listening to. And I think what's important about the statistics really are the under statistics, the, 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 the statistics that get less kind of focus. So we know that we're living in a world that is now predominantly urban. We know that the rate of urbanization in Africa will double in the next 30 years. But what is perhaps even more intriguing, take Africa for example, is that most of the urbanization that is happening is happening in what we call slums. It's happening in the informal sector. Most of the urbanization that is happening is happening in cities and towns that are about 500,000 population or less, where the technical capacity and the institutional capacity to address the challenge is least developed. And I think one of the most important things about the growth of informality in this particular context is that informality, both in terms of the economy and in terms of the built environment, has become the norm. So in a kind of upside down imagery of the future that I get from slum dwellers, I believe that we, the formal dwellers, are ill-equipped for the future. We don't know how to deal with what's coming our way. But slum dwellers live with it on a day-to-day -day basis. They are the image of the survivors of the future, who come to learn and work in a society in which the, both the market and the state has failed to address their needs and force them to find ways to address it in conjunction with those two institutions. So looking a little bit again back to the statistics, and giving you an idea of the scale of this challenge. In sub-Saharan Africa, 40% of the people who live in slums do not have land tenure, do not have water and sanitation that is adequate, do not have decent housing, and live in overcrowded conditions. That is the scale of the sort of sustainability challenge that we face. I want to look briefly at some of the structural challenges that we face. And I think for me the most important structural challenge is that the urban poor remain <coughs> invisible. I, I can't tell you how many extraordinary social entrepreneurs I know who come from slums. I know how many social entrepreneurs are sitting in this room who come from slums. That's only one example of it. And I think that is part of a reflection of why poor people feel alienated. They feel alienated because they are alienated. They are not recognized and their right to citizenship and what it means to be part of the city is just simply not recognized. Not only by the general public but more disturbingly by the major institutions that affect their lives. The city governments and the market. Another factor that really is a serious structural challenge is that democratization doesn't seem to make a difference. In most cities, public policy remains based on approaches that deepen and perpetuate inequality and exclusion. And I think this has been a very disturbing trend for me. 
that I've seen in countries where there is an anti-poor government and countries where there is a pro-poor government the same policy frameworks and the same impact on the lives of urban poor people living in slums. Another issue that relates to this is that the great strengths that I believe informality brings to our cities, one, incrementalism, step-by-step -step phase emergence and development and evolution of a better future, and two, just the general informality, working sort of outside the framework of the law. These are not only disregarded, but they're often considered illegal. So we talk about the challenges that face urbanization, and we see this challenge around big-scale political conflicts, cultural, um, religious conflicts. But the biggest challenge and the most unspoken challenge that happens in cities is evictions. Probably more people are affected by evictions in our society and forced removals than they're affected by displacements by war. But evictions just kind of keep on going. Even in pro-poor, very democratic societies, evictions are still the norm. And lastly, I'd like to say that what builds up to what is becoming an urban poly crisis, for which I'm not sure, I'm beginning to try to understand where the solutions are. But I think the last dimension of this urban poly crisis is that the voices of the urban poor are crowded out by the voices of experts. And that the experts really, in many ways, is, ways, cannot comprehend the challenges that the urban poor face. A very good colleague of mine, who is also an, uh, a Skoll Fellow, um, Martin van Hildebrand, who works with uh, Amazonian indigenous people, made an extraordinary comment yesterday. He said, I've been working with the, urban, uh, with, with the indigenous Amazonians for 40 years, and I still don't think I understand them, and I don't think they understand me. And so my job is just to open the space to be the vector for them to address their own challenges and resolve their own problems. I think we will not begin to address the structural challenges that we face until the urban poor can speak and address the issues that, addre that challenge them for themselves. Thank you, Joe. Next context, Melanie. Well, first of all, thank you guys for being here. It just resonates with how important I think this topic is about the migration, but also I, Joel touched upon the informality, and I think that's also a really important point. I'm gonna keep my comments, my initial comments really brief since they've already kind of painted the context. And I think for logistical reasons, we put the slides on, my slides on the, the second part of the conversation around creative mm -hmm. solutions, so. But I'm uh, just, background, I'm gonna be focusing more with the, uh, a lens on Brazil, and in particular, um, just kind of paint the, the urbanization uh, phenomenon that's happening there. 80% um, of the population now live in the southeast Brazil, and in particular in two cities, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. And if you take a look at Rio de Janeiro, for example, there's about 33% officially who live in favelas. So, uh, but most government workers on the inside will tell you that's more like 40%. So when you have that kind of dynamic going on and the World Cup coming up, <laughs> you can imagine uh, a lot of the tensions that are being created. Um, I don't know if many of you have been following what has happened in, in Rio recently and how they're kind of trying to bring a more integrated city where the actual favelas or the slums would be considered and they'd be building infrastructure into these communities. But it's also come by bringing in a new police force in, into that, uh, these, this, this city where about 30 of the, the favelas, of the 1,000 favelas, now have a new police force that are trying to run out the dr drug gangs in order to replace it with, with um, um, a more a different government, shall we say. Um, but comes with that a lot of challenges, and we can get into that momentarily. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out that we're finding in our research is about this informality. And again, as Joel mentioned, it was informality is, is f just on the boom. Uh, Stanford just had a conference actually on informal economies. Um, and it, McKinsey mentioned at that conference that by the year 2020, 50% of the world are gonna be an informal economy. That's staggering. Now mind you I, you, know, I think our initial reaction is thinking of maybe people on the streets selling candies and things like that. Um, but it, it's also the Airbnbs of the world and uh, that are actually creating a, and, and the pirating of software, that type of things that, that's included in that number. 
But uh, on the, in the favela and the slum instance of informality, what we're finding in our research, and I'll get into that momentarily in what we do, but essentially uh, we're finding it depends on the, the community. There's some communities that are massive that tend to have more informal economies in it than the smaller uh, communities where people have to go outside in order to find jobs. Therefore, they're not in the informal economy technically. So that kind of is an inter interesting differentiation, maybe contrary to what we would think. So I'm going to stop at the moment and <coughs> pass it back to the panel to talk more broadly about the context. Again, my, my lens right now is from Brazil, and we'll get into kind of more of the solutions later. But Osama? Okay, thank you. So the our fourth uh, setup is uh, from Osama, who set up an organization called Taquadian. And he's going to say something about that context. So good morning. My story is actually microcosmic and at the beginning, very, very depressing. But I do promise you that uh, before the hour is over, you're going to be very inspired. Uh, <laughs> I was born and raised in uh, Alexandria. I live in uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, uh, after the revolution, had the opportunity to see an area called Manshayit Nasser in Cairo, where surprisingly, as you walk around, you find so many antennas on top of graveyards and ask, do people live here? And the answer is yes. How many? Uh, the governor of Cairo will tell you 200,000. The number is 1.2 million. So I'll go back and continue in numbers. Of these, 76% are unemployed. There are schools where students are enrolled in sixth grade. 60% of the students are illiterate and alphabetical. Uh, at birth, the life expectancy is 33 and the child mortality rate is 5% in year one. And to bring it closer so that you can actually visualize what you would see, eight people live in an apartment of a room. As you walk in, of course, there is no electricity. And you see something moving. You say, what is that, a rat? Say, no, 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 this is my daughter. Under the bed? Yeah. Why? He says, well, she broke her hip eight years ago. She has been living under the bed for eight years. <coughs> you find the girl running around with a child. And you say, uh, your name, Reham. Uh, who's this, uh, your, your brother? He says, no, no, my son. And you're, uh, you know, again, we were talking about uh, girls, not brides, so to speak. Huh? And uh, it's very hard to actually imagine, well, how old are you? Like uh, 16, 18, 14? Because the child is about three. And you say, well, so you've been married very, very young. He says, no, I'm not married. Divorced? I've never been married. So who's the father? He says, well, I think it's maybe Ibrahim. And that's a guy standing right next to her. And he says, no, 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 that's not me. And I said, so who is, who is he? And she said, it's my father. So with that context, I'm going to sit down and then share with you what we have done about it. Okay. So we have a fairly strong picture of the, the, the challenges that, that, uh, that face us. And we're going to move into some of the experience of, as we move from for the formality of the initial presentation to something slightly more conversational, we're going to be beginning to talk through some of the things that are happening on the ground that have a slightly more optimistic and inspirational edge, starting with Melanie. Melanie. So let me, uh, what we do is at Mobile Metrics is uh, we're a market research company that's looking at the needs of these communities. In particular, we've launched in, as I mentioned, in Brazil. And this will give you an idea of what we're talking about as far as the, the types of migration that's happening to these areas. In the case of Rio, um, and this particular favela is Moro dos Macacos. It's in the northern zone. It's a very poor area of Rio de Janeiro, um, the zone is as a whole. And it has about 16% migration, excuse me, 26% migration coming from other parts of Brazil. And the majority of that's from the northeastern part of the Brazil, the very poor regions. So they end up in situations like this. And our work got started actually in this particular community, um, visiting it at one point, realizing you know, how, and asking how many people lived here, and getting answers from one government official saying 5,000 and then another government official saying 55,000. 
So you're realizing if we could be all 50,000 people, right, in one community, you know, how far off are we around the world? And yet billions and billions of dollars at this conference as well, right, are probably being spent in communities like this without really knowing uh, who they are and what their needs are. So that was the basis of our work, uh, which is really getting at who are these people? Because how can we serve them if we don't know who they are? I mean, accurate information, right, is the fundamental first step to solving any social problem. So how we went about it is by basically really uh, employing and training the local community members, uh, these young adults who go door to door using handheld technology to collect the data. So that's the how we do the collection. Um, by the way, this picture on the right is up in the northeast of Brazil. Uh, we found out in our research that these people, there were about 2,000 families that weren't even counted in the census. They, they lived in this, in this community, a slum, but they were on the part of the slum that were this series of shacks. And I guess perhaps the census people didn't want to go in and go one door after another because it was like a maze connected by doors. So when you open one door, you go in, you find, and then have to open another, and there's several houses. So no one managed to go into this maze, and again, 2,000 families, and this woman being one of them. And you would never know, but if you go out the back door, which she doesn't have, you have to go around the side, she's actually living along a, a, a river, quote unquote, that's essentially a sewer system right now. So that's some of the things that we're uncovering through the work that we're doing. I think the, the key here is being connected and using the community, and this is where the optimism starts coming in, and seeing that these people are now becoming, through this work, the drivers of their own change. I can't tell you how many of the local mobile agents, as we call them, are coming back shocked about some of the things they're seeing in their own communities. And yet, these, are, these people are the future. These young adults are the future of their communities. So hopefully, that's lighting a fire inside of them. The, probably the key part of our work, though, is not just extracting data. And by the way, the, our business model is we contract to non, nonprofits, to private sector, and to uh, in, uh, nonprofits, private sector, and as well as governments. Uh, with the whole mission is to raise the visibility about the needs and realities of these people in order to connect them to critical products and services. So that's our, our, our mission. And so I've talked about extracting the data, right, and the way we do it, but there's also an element here that I think is probably the most important of all, and that's making sure there's a social return that goes back into the community. And it's how we do that after the data is collected, we make sure there's a delivery of an information product and a service. And I'll just give you a quick uh, example that we did recently with Unilever around hand washing and treatment of water, for example. <laughs> they wanted to understand, Unilever wanted to understand the habits and attitudes of people in these communities and how they're actually, you know, where are they on the hygiene front. Um, and of course, you know, there's an interest from, from companies like Unilever to see if there is a more market for them but also doing it uh, in a re socially responsible way. And that's our onus on our organization to make sure they do do it in a socially responsible way by assuring there's information products and services that go back in. So in this case, the information was they literally showed, the mobile agent showed them after the survey how to wash their hands, followed by giving samples. In this case, it's Lifebuoy, Unilever Lifebuoy soap. It's an antibacterial soap. So it's good branding for the company, but at the same time, leaving a benefit behind for the community members. Then they are giving also, if you notice on his lap, there's a piece of paper. He's going to give her an invitation to come to a seminar on hygiene that the Minister of Health is, is handling and is going to be doing a lot of Q&A and, and discussion on hygiene habits. And there they have a chance to win a water purifier uh, that's also a non-electrical water purifier that, uh, that we had uh, arranged with Unilever as that's one of their products as well. This is a picture of someone winning <laughs> the, the water purifier. So in this case, there were like 86 mobile agents, 16,000 bars of soap that were given out, and 1,200 uh, 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 Unilever Purette um, non-electrical water purifiers. So the idea here about the social impact is making sure it's not just strip mining data, as I call it, and leaving, you know, or just giving a money incentive, which is nice, but also making sure it's something long-lasting that stays in the community. And that goes as far as when the mobile agent takes off their uniform, that they're like the go-to source now for anything related to, to, uh, to hygiene. 
Uh, we did a project on dengue fever with uh, Johnson & Johnson, for example, and also that was uh, found out the government was saying there was a 4% infection rate in these communities. And then through our door-to-door, last-inch research, uh, discovered there's actually 20%. So this is kind of the power of the data, but hopefully to incentivize on a meta level other, other organizations to take action uh, in things that happen. I just want to end with our work with saying, again, probably the best part for me is the mobile agents, no question. This is Tiago. He was one of our first mobile agents. And uh, as I mentioned, they're the leaders of tomorrow in their community. And this, this photo was taken a few weeks after, well, we always do interviews, and I was early in, on engaged in the interview process, obviously, myself. We always ask, why do you want this job? And uh, Tiago sat across from me and held up his hand and said, because I lost these two fingers from a hand grenade in a war with the police. Now, mind you, I was kind of new to the community, <laughs> more of just macacos that you saw earlier, and in doing this work. And so, of course, you can imagine the rush of thoughts going through my head. But at the same time, it's like, you know, you're thinking, you know, you're doomed if you hire them and it doesn't work out, and you're doomed maybe if you don't hire them. But at the same time, you're sitting there thinking, why else are we here, right? Ended up hiring Tiago. He was phenomenal in the field. Um, and then went on to go into college and uh, get his MBA, and is working now at an international uh, te telecommunications subsidiary that own, is owned by AT&T, flying all around Brazil. And what the crazy thing is for me is he insists on staying and living in Morro dos Macacos. Even though he's been frisked with this new uh, police force that I told you about, he's been frisked several times coming home from work. But he still wants to live in Macacos. And this is interesting. You know, the question is why, right? Why, Chiago? Why are you building your home and your family there? And he's like, you know, Melanie, this is my home. My family and friends are here. I don't want to leave. So the, the point here is, meeting them where they're coming from. And what I, we're starting to find out in kind of the work that we're doing too is how can we stand here and say, these are the critical products and services you need. But now with time through the resource, research, research, it's coming back from them what we want and need. So it's very becoming much more community driven, right? And community led as to where we need to do our research as well. So I think the potential here is huge in mobilizing the base of the pyramid, well, and we'll get into conclusions in a minute, but I, I think there's just a tremendous untapped human resources that we just tend to neglect. And again, how we can engage and tap into these human resources to obviously make better their own living situations, but also outside in the world as a whole. Of the Chiagos of the world, there are many of them. I think it's just a matter of us sometimes rolling the dice on someone, because if someone's always rolled the dice on you sometime in your life, right? So I think that's part of why we're here as well. So thank you. Melanie, thank you. We're going to go backwards this, this time around, and so we're going to come to uh, some of the work of Takwadi, and we move from the dystopian to the inspirational. Osama, do you want to come back to us? And then the beginning up. of the solution actually started with a wonderful man. His name is uh, Jawad Nabulsi. Uh, he had hoped to be with us today. Uh, he was hit by a bullet during the revolution, uh, which uh, led him to lose his eye. In the process of running out of Tahrir Square to go and get uh, medical help, he ended up seeing many, many people in the street. So he stopped at each, took their name and mobile number to bring them medical help, 900 of them. Uh, when uh, he found out about Manshiyat Nasser, the area that I spoke of, uh, he created a, non a non-profit called Nibni, which uh, uh, those of you who speak Arabic know means we build. Uh, Nibni Foundation is uh, a nonprofit. We have it uh, in California as well as a 5013C. And uh, tackled, if you will, the issues related to how do you rebuild both hope, human skills, and uh, employment. Uh, the first one was in education, and we are very lucky to have a Microsoft team with us uh, to donate tablets, sometimes through the corporation, and sometimes uh, through its uh, employees, and with a matching one for one for every dollar that you are able to raise. Uh, as a consequence, in the last year and a half, we have been able to uh, help 12,000 students learn in Arabic from content created uh, either from the curriculum of the government, but most importantly from the Khan Academy that has been translated by uh, Midan and by Guru in, uh, in, uh, in Palo Alto as well. Uh, Interestingly enough, the key 
to actually enabling the children to learn was not the use of tablets, but to convince the teachers who were conspiring not to teach them so that they can give them private lessons that it is in their interest to work with us and we'll pay their salary <laughs> so that they can uh, kind of unite and build uh, rather than uh, divide and conquer. Uh, on the medical side, imagine when you have a community that does not have medical facility and where if uh, a daughter is sick and the father will take her and uh, walk to the next uh, village where he can actually get medical facility or zone and wait maybe for a day or two and then be told, well, actually, we cannot take you because we don't, the, the machine is broken, the dialysis machine is broken. That's impossible, right? Uh, through the mobilization of the expatriate community in, uh, in, uh, in California, one of the medical doctors actually donated equipment to equip 14 different clinics for a facility that is now up and running. And I'm talking about oncology, dialysis, I mean, everything, really. Uh, the net impact of this, based on the experience we've had so far, is potentially to save up to 50 thousand lives a year in just one little <laughs> neglected zone in Cairo. On the, the vocational training, so it's really a combination of um, uh, borrowing some of the experiences that we've had in uh, Palestine and effectively uh, picking up a number of volunteers and community leaders. There are now 480 uh, volunteers, uh, mostly women, and that's where, in my opinion, the highest effectiveness has come from. Uh, and then uh, move on from initially, it was about you know project management, uh, nursing, uh, financial accounting, uh, painting. So things that are more or less handcrafts. And now we're starting to move more and more towards uh, coding, which is actually being uh, quite transformational. Uh, my wife and I actually pseudo adopted uh, Jawad and uh, today, we feel that uh, the mobilization of the community is not only going to help Manshayat Nasser, but that we would like to reach to uh, the diaspora community, the Egyptian community around the world, and then say, the model works. For God's sake, pick up one village and make a difference. It doesn't cost too much, it doesn't take too much, but the impact of saving lives and better livelihood is such that if you were to live two lives, you would say, I know what I would do, what I would like to be remembered by, the legacy that I would like to leave behind. Joe, slum, slum dwellers international have been very experienced in building up some of these things, so maybe you can take us through. Sure, thank you. Um, I have to put the spotlight on Jockin once again uh, and tell you about his first engagement with me because I think there's something that really speaks to creative solutions about my first experience. Um, I was asked in 1991, I'll picture South Africa in 1991, just after the unbanning of the political organizations, the return of the political exiles, the uplifting of the cultural boycott. I was asked by the Southern African Catholics Bishops Conference to organize a conference of shack dwellers to talk about what opportunities they saw would come their way in a post-apartheid South Africa. By the way, that earned me the nickname, the Jewish anarchist who works for the Catholic Church. <laughs> and I've, I've been trying to shake that ever since without success. Uh, when, when we organized this conference, we invited 12 outside professionals to come and speak to us. Professionals and activists, not only professionals. And we knew we were going to get them because the cultural boycott had just been lifted, so they all wanted to come and see South Africa. Except for one guy, that guy over there, he refused to come. And eventually I managed through various ways to get him to change his mind. And he came to this conference. The third day of the conference was on Sharpful Day. Sharpful Day, 1991. There were 150 shack dwellers in this meeting, and they were at each other's throats. Half of them were saying, when the ANC comes to power, the Freedom Charter says there will be land and housing for all. Why are you organizing yourselves? The ANC will deliver. And the other half were saying, wait a minute, let's listen. This idea of learning and sharing from one another is not such a bad idea. And Jockin stood up. By the way, we have a, also we have a, we've developed a nickname for Jockin since he got this award. We call him the Skull Awardee with the most arrests. <laughs> so, 
So that gives you some idea about his past, which I'm not going to divulge. But when he stood up in the midst of this mayhem, he picked up on the South African slogans and he shouted, Viva! And everybody, of course, shouted, Viva ANC! Viva Mandela! With great joy, because here was an Indian who was identifying with their struggle. And he shouted, Amandla! And they all shouted, Nguetu! And they were all very, very excited. And he quietened them down. And he said, great. Now tell me, can you eat your Amandla? Can you live in your Viva? And that was the birth of Slum Dwellers International. And I think what that tells us is around the beginning of creative solutions. The solution definitely lies for us in communities organizing themselves. But it's about how they organize themselves. It's about them organizing themselves around their internal capacities, not around external promises or opportunities. Those external promises and opportunities are important, but the only way you will secure them is through developing your own internal capacities. And that, I think, is the most powerful lesson that we have picked up from the pavements of Bombay, because he may be the representative of the organization, and I may be the secretariat, but I'm very embarrassed to tell you that this is predominantly a women's organization, and that the real origins of these methodologies come from women who live on the pavements of Baikala, still till today, many of them, in shacks the size of from me to those desks. And what they have learned is that they organize themselves around their internal capacities, but that in itself is not enough, because one settlement on its own is not going to resolve its problems. They have to network themselves. They have to create linkages with other communities at the settlement level, at the city level, at the national level, and through Slum Dwellers International at the global level. They have to create local and national federations of the urban poor. And I want to come back a little bit to how they do that. The third thing that I think has been a very creative solution is where SDI has positioned professionals like me. And I think what has been interesting, and perhaps that's why in many ways a South African with a long history in South African politics plays a role as the secretariat. Because in a way, the role of professionals in the struggles of the urban poor is the same as the role of whites in the anti-apartheid struggle that was fighting for the rights of blacks. We all learned a great deal from the likes of Steve Biko in the years of the black consciousness movement, that the role of whites in the struggle was not to hog the limelight, not to set the agenda, and not to propose the solutions, but to create the space and the opportunities for black South Africans to take up the struggle themselves, to voice their priorities, and to lead the agenda for change. And this is very much a fundamental tenet of STI. It is Jokin and his federation leadership that drive the program. It is myself and a small cohort of professionals who are there to provide technical and professional support. And the third and final lesson, I think, is to move away from confrontation with state institutions, not because state institutions don't deserve to be confronted, but because it doesn't get you anywhere. You might get a little bit of moral joy or a sense of self-righteousness, but without the local governments, you can't transform cities at scale. So there's very little value in alienating them. So we have moved from confrontation to what we call militant negotiations. We take the struggle to the boardroom, and we sit around the meeting halls of the cities, and we come up with solutions that we challenge them to co-produce with ourselves. So I think the results of that, just very briefly to speak of you, because of this crazy idea, we now operate in 35 countries and over 550 cities. There are women's savings networks in all these cities where women get together and they save small amounts of money. But don't get me wrong, this is not a microcredit agenda. This is a way to monetize political capital. The slum dwellers in Slum Dwellers International save small amounts of money so that when they sit down with their governments, they're not empty-handed. They say, this is what we're putting on the table. What are you putting on the table? And what is more, because they're networked, and just to give you the numbers, STI has a, a global fund of about $5 million US dollars. Almost $2 million of that money comes from the savings of slum dwellers who earn peanuts. And that's not to even talk about the money that they have in their national funds and their city funds. So that when a project starts and money is called for, and a project goes on in Lilongwe, Malawi, the investors in that project are slum dwellers 
in Manila, Philippines, in Bolivia, you name it. So that this co-production between communities and government is not just a co-production between the government and the communities that are facing the challenge, but of a global network of the urban poor who have a stake in the outcomes of their interventions. Thank you. And we'll come on to Doug now. To Doug. Great. Um, I think this has provided you some, some very good details on specific uh, areas. And that helps illustrate what uh, I'd like to talk about, which is what can be done to turn around uh, marginal urban neighborhoods, slums, what I call arrival city districts, the places that are the bottom rung on the ladder of the rural to urban transition, uh, when they go wrong, when, when they fall into intergenerational poverty, when they fall into extremism and violence and, uh, and, and uh, all the social troubles that happen to these places. I think we misunderstand a lot of these districts because we look at their residents as being statistical points on a chart, as being poverty rates, as being disease rates, as being infant mortality rates, and so on. And they're often, they're often not positive indicators. And we need to start understanding them, uh, as we've heard here, from their own perspective, not as points on a table, but as points along a trajectory, along a dotted line. Almost anybody who lives in these bottom rung urban districts sees themselves as being on a trajectory, sees their family as being on a trajectory that began in a village somewhere, usually in their own country, but not always, uh, and that has further dotted line extending beyond their own life through their children's life into the core established economy of the city. Um, even if this has failed, even if they've fallen into three generations of poverty and being stuck in a squalid slum. They, that vision maintains, that connection to the originating village very much stays uh, in place. I found families who'd been living in favelas in Brazil since the 1950s, <coughs> sometimes the 1940s, who were still sending a third to a half of their weekly income back to the village in northeastern Brazil. In China, this is the norm. Uh, and so on. The main source of rural development in most developing countries is money sent from these transitional urban districts. It outstrips all agricultural earnings. In China, the largest source of rural revenue since about 2005 has not, ha has not been agricultural production, but has been money sent by relatives uh, in the city. This is not just true in China, it's also true in Morocco. It's even true in Poland where uh, remittances from people working in Britain and Ireland uh, outstrip both agricultural earnings and EU and Polish government agricultural subsidies. So you need to understand these dire slums as being a key source of rural development uh, as well. And that is a large part of why people stay in them even when they're miserable. I asked one woman uh, in Mumbai after I'd visited her village, which was beautiful, beautiful looking, uh, the, the most deadly places often are the most beautiful looking. Uh, why she was staying in this place with sewage river running past her house and, and, and criminal gangs and so on. And she said, well, uh, here, if things go badly for me, as they sometimes do, I might need to send one of my children out to sell individual cigarettes on the street to passing motorists, which is as humiliating for a family there as, as it would be anywhere. But back in the village, if things went wrong for me, one of my children would die. And that, that is what keeps people there. It is, it is, even at its worst, it tends to be on average a better standard of living. And there is, there is a view of the people who live there as being on a trajectory from the village in transition and so on. It's the reason why a lot of the purchasing decisions you see in informal urban communities don't seem to make sense. I found in, um, in South America and in the Indian subcontinent that often the, the person who is easiest, the, the way to get into a slum district and way to understand its statistics and its people was through the biggest provider of infrastructure available. Now infrastructure, um, electricity tends to exist in um, 
the slums of Asia and the Americas, not so much in, in Africa, uh, in slums because people tap into electrical lines informally. Um, running water, very rarely. Toilets, almost never. Um, cell phone service now, almost universally. But uh, the one form of infrastructure, infrastructure that comes before any of these often is cable television. And the cable walla uh, is often the person who's the keeper of statistics, who's the, uh, who connects the people there to larger organizations, and who knows who everybody is. Very useful guy. He has a ledger book. Uh, and so on. And I wondered for a long time why families that are getting by on maybe four or five dollars per day per family uh, are spending three dollars and fifty cents per month for in, in Bangladesh, for example, for a package of 16 uh, Hindi and Arabic and English uh, cable TV channels. Partly as a form of childcare, because you're working 10 hours a day somewhere and you need something to stick your children in front of, like many of us do. Um, but also because when you get talking to people, they see it as an aspirational purchase. As for, right, for us right now in this slum, uh, that $3.50 a month is a very large proportion of our monthly earnings. But we fully imagine either ourselves or our children to be the sort of people for whom that $3.50 a month is a negligible part of their, of their income. It's a laying down of a token on a future standard of living that you fully expect to have. And a lot of the purchasing decisions in, in, in formal urban communities are based on this notion that it's laying down of a token on a life that you expect to have. So when you start to understand the slum dweller, uh, the rural to urban migrant, as being somebody on a trajectory, then you start to understand the social problems of the arrival city, not as being intergenerational problems that require welfare interventions or, or, or policing or so on, but as being interruptions in a transition. Something is blocking the natural desire of the rural to urban migrant and their offspring to make it in urban life. And there's a, a law of the arrival city, I say, which is the thing that makes an urban district into what I call an arrival city is often the thing that will later make it fail as an arrival city. Why is that? What makes these places the bottom rung on the urban ladder? It's because for some reason they have housing costs that are considerably lower than anywhere else in the city. To follow the bootstrap logic that you are too, if you're from a village, you're too poor to possibly live in the city, yet you need to live in the city to have that urban income that is the main source of income. So you have to find a place that nobody else wants to live. So why is it that the housing cost is so much lower in these areas? And that usually is the answer to the question of why they're going to fail later. The housing cost may be lower for physical reasons, because physically they're located very far from the city. Physically, they're located on the edge of a sewage lagoon, or a swamp, or a railway line, or an international airport, or up and down the edge of a cliff like in Caracas or, or Rio. These physical problems are going to become, they allow it to be the bottom rung on the ladder, but they basically knock away the second and third rungs on the ladder. What governments and agencies and social ventures can help with is providing these one-time interventions that place the second and third rungs back on the ladder. These districts often do not require continuous long-term support from governments. They require a one-time intervention. On the and the three types of barriers that can be helped with interventions, first of all, is what I call the citizenship barriers. Simply not recognizing the people living in these districts as being citizens of your city, sometimes even citizens of your country. Seeing them as a cancer on the side of the city rather than parts of your citizenship. We don't understand this, that very often internal rural to urban migrants are seen as being alien foreigners in the same way that international immigrants are. Those favela dwellers that Melanie deals with, they're from the Northeast, they speak a different dialect. They're seen by the people of Rio and Sao Paulo as being aliens. Uh, in China, very often in, in those districts, it's people from the uh, inland provinces who look and sound different and are treated different. All over the place, this is a thing. And also, just generally, policies don't see them. These Ashwayat districts in, in Cairo, uh, which you know, more than half the population live in. For generations, governments of Egypt have not recognized them as being citizens, have not built schools, have not built hospitals. No surprise, it's the, it's, it's the, it's the Salafis, it's the Muslim Brotherhood who build all the schools and hospitals and provide a de facto urban government. In, in the Brazilian favelas, 
the government doesn't recognize it, doesn't build schools, doesn't build anything. It's the narco trafficante drug gangs that, that provide the de facto municipal government. So overcoming those re citizenship recognition barriers is the first thing. The second is the physical barriers I mentioned. Distance, uh, form of housing, and so on. Fixing those things with a quick intervention can work very well. Sao Paulo was able to turn some of its worst favelas into quite successful, hopeful districts. Uh, with better incomes simply by providing bus service into them. So your little ice cream shop becomes a place that people from all over Sao Paulo go and shop at so that your, your job uh, is no longer four hours away, it's now half an hour away and your children aren't left in the pavements between buildings and so on. And finally, institutional barriers, as I mentioned, schools, hospitals, but also land tenure, allowing people to have some ownership deed on the shack that they live in. Uh, can transform things. If you look at the dis if we, we've uh, talked about this, the, if you look at the difference between the slum districts in Africa that are horrible and squalid and those that are somewhat hopeful, it's usually the difference between renting and, and owning and so on. So these are all the interventions that almost anywhere in the world can can help. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for, for uh, drawing to a quick conclusion there. Uh, we've got this, uh, uh, the panel can remain seated. We're going to move into the how we think about uh, scaling scaling some of these particular experiences up, but also I want to try and draw the audience in. So if we'll start with, with Joel for any ideas about uh, how we draw on those experiences about what's worked, but also what's not worked in crossing international boundaries. But if people can begin to indicate around the room if you want, if you want to come in or you have, have questions, I'll begin to try and draw people in as, as, as well. But Joel, uh, the, uh, I think Samuel Beckett always says, fail again, fail better, right? <laughs> and, uh, so I was just wondering about uh, what, what are the stories about what, what doesn't work as well as what does work in scaling up some of the uh, slum dwellers' international experience? Thank you. Well, I, I would start off by um, underscoring that the private sector and the market are critical actors in creating a process of urbanization. But if you leave it to them and their own devices, you will end up with enclave urbanization, fragmentation, and a further um, escalation of the divisions between the rich and the poor. And that the, the real vector for change is organized communities. The challenges that are faced is that there are so many factors working against creating and sustaining organized communities. It's not in the interest of the local politicians. It's not in the interest of slumlords. It's not in the interest even to create pragmatic organizations that are committed to radical negotiations, as I mentioned, to move away from a male-dominated, contested, confrontational approach. I think the other thing that is a dual challenge is to move local governments to understand that while they are one of the key pillars for transforming cities, their primary partner are the organized poor, and that other stakeholders have supporting roles. What so often happens is that the supporting roles play primary roles together with the local authorities and reinforce the problem by further dismissal of the the full rights of the poor by not recognizing them as actors in the transformations of their settlements, but beneficiaries of solutions that are imposed upon them from outside, which so frequently fail. So you think of the World Bank's site and service programs that start on a very good premise, but almost always fail because poor people are simply organized to take over what other people have delivered. I think another real challenge that we faced, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that urban poverty is not recognized as a critical issue, and slums in particular are not recognized as a critical issue. And that's very much also seen in terms of the way in which resources flow. Uh, I don't think international agencies are really one of the critical players in this process, but if you look at international agencies, the upgrading of slums and the creation of inclusive cities are hardly ever on their agenda. And finally, I think the other real constraint is that there is this preoccupation with formalized cities. I mean, every mayor in every southern country wants his city to have the next Olympic Games and to attract tourists. And slums are therefore seen as a deterrent from these possible forms of development. And therefore, the solution to slums is to eradicate them and eliminate them. 
that reinforces this perception of poor people being outsiders and cancers on the body of the city. That is why Jockin always talks not about slum-free cities, but slum-friendly cities that create the opportunities for the incremental development, the moving from the first rung to the second rung to the third rung. Olympic Games in Brazil going to be a, <laughs> a good, a good positive thing, or a, yeah. oh, that's that's a that's a yeah, long that's, that's a whole nother panel. <laughs> 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 uh, but it's it's definitely interesting times right now. Um, uh, my three points to probably lessons learned and, and scaling up would be uh, around social return, uh, around the differences in communities, around community drivers as change agents. Our uh, communities as, as the drivers of change. On the social return front, um, you can tell I'm a real believer in harnessing also the power of the private sector. I think it's critical. You look around this room, anything and everything has been made by the private sector. And you take that out into the world, it's the same thing. So without harnessing the private sector, we're really not going to get to that scalable change we want. But I also agree there's a lot of uh, boundaries and limits we need to put into place to make sure that that social return, or, or excuse me, a so social return is happening and it's long last and, and it's not to the detriment of these communities. And so back to making sure that we bake into any of our solutions, that especially when working with private sector, I think. Because again, you guys, we have an opportunity to recreate business here, right? And a, a huge part of that now is putting in that, that triple bottom line or that double bottom line. And, and, I think, and I think it's our onus and our opportunity and for those who are entrepreneurs within companies, too, are wanting to do that. And by the way, I work, I also teach at Stanford on social entrepreneurship and can speak to the millennials as also wanting to make sure that's a part of their future, that they're working for an organization, uh, turning down the Goldman Sachs in order to work for another organization. Sorry, Goldman Sachs, but you know what I'm saying. They're looking to make sure it's not whitewashing, but there's something real happening. So I think to, for us to continue that and be a real strong advocate for that, and to turn down business, and what we do, there's two litmus tests. You have to have critical products and services that are useful for the community, but secondly, you have to have a track record of social responsibility, or oh, we're not gonna work for you. We, all, we realize that information is power, so we wanna put that into the hands, obviously, of the people who are doing the good work in the world, right? The second point was around differences. The short on this is not every community is the same, and it's very easy for us to generalize but to really make sure that we understand the differences and that we speak to those differences. Sure, we can build standards for our solutions, but see where we can tweak it. And then the third point is around uh, the community as drivers of change. And I mean, we've we pounded that a lot here on this panel because I think we're real believers in, in this untapped resources that are there. But I think taking it to the next step um, and getting those, those community members, those community leaders uh, to the table with the powers that can make the changes. Uh, we just brought down a couple of weeks ago a community leader from Rio de Janeiro with a team leader of ours up in Recife and one of our team who's grown up through mobile metrics from the favela at the same table as the head of Uni you know, the president of Unilever Brazil and his team. Can you imagine that dialogue? I mean, these are the guys who are going to be changing the prices and changing the, the packaging and the da-da-da-da-da, right? And what products in, in general these communities need. And that's where I think we need to take it, or what our solutions are even further to making that change happen and being the bridge to, to make that happen. Before I throw it on Summer and Doug again, do people, I'm keen to try and draw out some points from the audience. So we've got somebody, a couple here, we'll, we'll take a couple of points there and there to begin with. If you could introduce yourselves before you. Um, <laughs> I'm Natalie, I'm from Homeless International and Real Development. We've had the pleasure of working with SDI and jockeying for a number of years and we're incredibly proud of our association with them and the fantastic work they've done. Um, and as there is, an, there is a panel here who is speaking to social entrepreneurship and the challenges of the 21st century, there seems to have been a lot of discussion about the scale of the issue and how slums are not really being addressed at the scale at which they're developing. And similarly, there's been discussions about working with the private sector and about harnessing possibilities for capital at scale that can deliver solutions. So I just wondered if the panel could maybe speak to how they think that wonderful institutions like SDI, 
that Jockin and Joel have invested so much of their life in can become even bigger actors in delivering solutions because although they do have these funds which are wonderful, they do need to try and keep up with an ever-expanding problem and that will require an ever-expanding capital base. So I wondered if people could maybe speak to their thoughts on how that can be generated sustainably so those institutions can become kind of, for want of a, for want of a private sector term, wholesalers to the communities that they engage with so well. Thank you. I want to ask you guys to try to give us a slightly larger context for the city because you describe the city as being both very promising and very challenged as an institution in the 21st century. But implicit in the way you're talking about the problem is the almost complete irrelevance of the nation state and its core function, which is to maintain static boundaries, which is its core function. So. What happens to the relationship between the nation state and the city if we take a hopeful trajectory and begin to see this urbanization process as something to be encouraged and managed rather than impossibly squelched? Okay, and we'll take one more here and then I'm going to kind of come back to the panel again and then we'll try and come out again. We'll start with this. Fred DeSam Lazaro with the PBS News Hour in the United States. And I want to pick up on, on a question that. Oh, on an aspect of what was discussed, and that is these emerging partnerships with um, the private sector and the large private sector. And you mentioned Unilever. Uh, I'm on a reporting project just back from Bangladesh in which Unilever is engaged with CARE in a project called JITA. And one of the most controversial aspects of this partnership is, is, is almost aesthetic and political because this is the biggest purveyor of skin whitener in Bangladesh. And I just wonder if, if you could reflect on how politics of that nature and in, you know, even nuanced uh, more subtly can complicate you know, efforts to scale up this kind of development work both, you know, both in rural areas, which was the JITA project, as well as in, in urban development. I'll start, I'll start with the summer. Maybe, I mean, in the context of events in Egypt over the last few months, obviously the role of the nation state vis-à-vis -vis the city is incredibly prominent, but maybe that may or may not be a place to start, the answer to the second. Uh, I think it's an excellent question, and frankly, uh, our nation has become very deeply divided now, uh, and the state, as represented by the government, is now considered more uh, the enemy than the solution. On the challenges of scaling uh, in our project, <coughs> uh, my son, who loves uh, fast vehicles, uh, compared it to having a Ducati in a field. You can go very, very fast. You've got the engine, you've got the formula, you've got actually the money. Uh, and you know where you'd like to go, but then there are, of course, stumbling blocks galore. The government is, of course, the biggest one of them. Uh, imagine the frustration when you're sitting, let's say, on $120,000 of money that you've raised, and you actually cannot wire it. Uh, when you have 480 volunteers rather than five, and yet the process of managing them, responsibilities, output, trustworthiness, compensation, and what have you, uh, is, uh, has not been thought of before because it's, uh, it has grown up too fast. In my opinion, these are challenges that any startup actually faces. Uh, you, uh, you launch it, and then along the way, uh, you pivot, you adjust, uh, you recognize what the challenges are, you surround yourself with trustworthy uh, uh, high performance and, and overcome the barriers. The one key element uh, that I think Jawad, if he was here, would say has helped us is that before deploying the services, we actually had to reach out to the families to gain their trust. So that in the end, even when the government came and saw spectacular success and decided to take the building that has been given to us to provide the service and said we are going to give it to a post office instead of a medical facility, it was the inhabitants, the 1.2 million people, who stood up and said no, and they brought the media to hear the voice. So I would say the buy-in of the stakeholders, not only of the change maker, uh, for us has been absolutely the key to success. Doug, scaling up some of the things you've given us the three principles, but how do you scale them up? And I think we need to recognize the scale of this is absolutely enormous and recognize the limitations of, of any intervention 
that we can do or any activity that we can do. We are not going to solve urban poverty uh, through anything that we do like this. Um, urban poverty is the solution to rural poverty and has large, it's the lar largest reason why, uh, r why w absolute poverty around the world has gone from half the world's population to less than a quarter over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, it's mainly a shift from rural poverty, which is deadly and which involves starvation, to urban poverty, where you don't starve to death, uh, but where your life is hardly uh, stable or wonderful. And there you get into these problems that people get stuck in, in urban poverty. And whether it's through uh, private sector or uh, public sector uh, interventions in marginal urban districts, and I think both are important, uh, you're not going to cause anybody to be any less poor. What you can do, though, is provide communities and neighborhoods with the resources they need to go on that trajectory that they want to go to develop small businesses within their districts, to develop internal economies, to develop the networks of support that link them back to their originating villages and then into the educational and political and economic system of the city that, that, that they're within. Um, we need, need to recognize that, uh, that uh, the, the people who live in these districts know what tools they need. Um, the fact that the largest soap company in the world is now trying to sell people in Brazil and Bangladesh on soap is an indication that, that, uh, that change is, is possible. When people start buying soap, that means that they're buying things for the first time in their life, that they've reached a level of economic activity where they, they can buy something. The first thing people buy anywhere in the world when they buy something is soap. I mean, uh, we forget that a century ago here in Europe and in North America, a very large proportion of our population were the recently rural poor who had just become the urban poor, and the first people to try to sell to them were the soap vendors. Uh, we, they invented such innovations as the soap opera in the 1920s as an effort to reach the semi-literate urban poor and to get them to buy something for the first time. Uh, and we're seeing that replicated now in some of the better off uh, urban poor districts in Brazil, in Bangladesh, and so on. There are some places where still even being able to, where, you know, harvesting garbage and making liquor from fruit is, are still the only forms of economic and prostitution, economic activity available for the urban poor. So we shouldn't forget that some of the levels of development we're talking about are extremely low. We still need to remember that trajectory, but we need to recognize that, uh, that th there are some people who, who for whom very basic supports uh, are what are needed to be able to help themselves. But the scale is large enough that we are not going to make them any less poor. We, need, we can only pr get rid of barriers to them helping themselves get less poor. I'm going to come back to Melanie and Joel in just a second, but does anyone else, we've got just a few minutes left, does anyone have any last <coughs> points or questions they wanted to raise while we've got the chance to do so? Okay, that's going to uh, open up some more time. Okay, Melanie, uh, I guess in terms of what we just heard on the Bangladesh, if, if economics simplifies, culture complicates. So what's, uh, how do we address some of the complexities that we are talking about? Well, thank you for raising that as an issue, first of all. Um, and certainly something we grapple with a lot. But let me start by saying, I can't tell you how many people cried just because they received bars of soap. And I think the point there is to listen again to the communities and what the people want and what they need. And I'm not familiar with this case in particular, and I'm sure there are companies, but I think it's looking at the products that the different companies are, are making and manufacturing. Certainly there's some that are good products that are really having a lasting impact, uh, some that perhaps aren't having a negative. But again, flipping it around from our judgment, which is really hard. I, I grappled with this all the time, reining back from you know, what I think the community needs and who we should go after to work with to you know, having it come from the community. So I'm hoping that um, Unilever, not only in Brazil, but around the world, um, as well as every company, starts really flipping and listening to, to what is wanted and needed. And I think it's our onus as social entrepreneurs or people who work with these communities to also try to think through the ripple effects on that. Maybe. The, the dilemma here is 
soap is a wonderful product and people will buy it first, but all really close to the top of the list of what's in demand is skin whitener Whitey. in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And the dilemma for CARE, which is in partnership with Unilever, is there's high demand for it. They don't like it that there's more demand for that than for sanitary pads. In, the, in, the, in these circumstances. They're trying to, to sell socially redeeming products, but they're forced to reconcile with the fact that it's the skin whitener that is bringing the margin of profit to this Avon lady force that they're trying to create in rural Bangladesh. So that's sort of the dilemma, the deal you have to make with the devil. I just give you all the chance. I mean, maybe just to I'll give find. you a chance to go. To, but there's a chance to have some informal discussions at the end. But Joel, you may get in at the end. I guess partly, in terms of that complexity, there is an issue of how we think partly about an ethics of the absent in a way. Both in terms of what you're saying, some of the really, some of the really poor sometimes shut out the really really poor who have just not arrived yet in the city, or some of the generations that have. I was going to want to just push you a bit on the challenge of. Uh, on the one hand, valorizing the, the people on the street, the people locally. On the other hand, what about the generations to come? H how do we see their voice spoken? And I suppose it ties into this point we just heard about the, com the complexity of, of needs and aspirations in, in, in that light. And then also in the last 30 seconds, you can say how we scale up <laughs> Slum Dwellers International for the, for the globe, right? And then if we have time, we, we carry on the network afterwards. Yeah, I think a lot of the solutions to the issue that you raise here has to lie at the hands of the state and the national state and the local state. Mm -hmm. We're talking all the time here about dealing with the current challenges that urbanization is throwing at us. And unless we get ahead of the curve, we're never going to solve it. And I think there is an onus on state institutions to create in enabling environments in which cities are planning for the in-migration of the urban poor and creating in advance land, basic services, access to transport in anticipation of the in-migration that is coming. In the absence of that, you have the exacerbation of the problems that you raise. And I think those problems are paralleled by other problems, which are gender problems, which is sort of a, an equally critical dimension that is unspoken of. The most marginal are not only the people who are coming now to the cities, but it's the women who are living in those slums. And I think the mechanisms that SDI is dealing with try to address both of those. I think Homeless International's question is the multi-billion dollar question. And I think we're still at the place where we need man, mad money from the international agencies and from philanthropists who are interested in the social bottom line to give resources to state institutions and their, lo their, their community participants to set ongoing precedents, many of which will fail, that demonstrate how market interventions can not only address social needs but generate financial returns and do it in ways that don't exclude those that you mentioned. But I think we're a long way off and at the moment we're just playing. But I think uh, a multiplicity of precedent setting projects in which the social outcomes are the measure are the ways in which to begin to move to ones in which the financial outcome also becomes a player. Can I just say, at the, the beginning of the session, what we hoped would be that uh, the participants might, at least in some ways, inspire the audience to think differently in at least one aspect of the challenge that we had as the subject of today's platform, the challenge or threat of the 21st century city. I think we've had fantastic contributions from across the panel. Um, there is an opportunity, I think there's a, a euphemism of informal discussion time, which I think basically means we don't get thrown out of this room straight away but you have a chance to network for 15, 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so uh, with either the other people in the room or the, the panel, if they can, they can stay. But uh, just before we do that, if we could uh, thank uh, the panel for the contributions. And thank you for the <laughs>